much, and uh, thank you for the introduction and inviting me here. I'm sure I don't do all of that, but I will talk a little bit about what we do in the center, and um, it relates particularly to actually talks in the last session on imaging, because that's my own field is computer vision. Um, but also, as you can see, we, we cover are other areas of signals. So um, the center is all around uh, multi-dimensional signal processing of various different forms. So that might be images, video, speech, audio, seismic measurements. And what we're essentially trying to do, which relates back to what was talked about at the beginning of the day, is extract understanding in different forms from those signals. So that's extracting usually things for people that add value to the raw data, uh, which in a medical imaging example we've already seen quite a lot of, but it might be uh, a number of other examples here. Um, and the, the, so the core of our activity is around pattern recognition, signal processing, and machine learning type techniques, I would say. And there's a, a bunch of applications around that. So I really wanted to talk about my own area, which is visual data, and why is this a big problem? Um, well, if you look at the internet, what's the internet made up of? Well, at the moment, it's about 60% visual data across the internet. That's predicted to increase to 80 to 90% visual data, just raw video that everyone's uploading essentially from their phones. Um, and what, we're, what we'd really like to be able to do is extract some value from that, other than you having to go onto YouTube and search through with a few uh, key tags that have been put in for the content you want. So we'd like to be able to extract other information, to have seen understanding, general seen understanding of that data. Um, and that would help with all sorts of things, but in the first instance, reducing the bandwidth that you need uh, for transmission to your device and having more, more intelligent ways of doing that. So that's the, the kind of larger scale problem. Uh, what I'm going to talk more about is the, the application of extracting understanding from visual data in media production applications. And again, this is a, you know, here's some figures for the kind of uh, size of content that you have. Um, and at the moment, in a lot of these applications, the, the data volumes are so large that you can't actually store the data. Yeah, that, that's the problem we get to. So you have to be able to do some sort of processing online to the data as it's collected. So uh, the particular example I'll, I'll talk about is film production, and it's not unusual to have a couple of pe petabytes of data for a single film production these days. Um, with the raw data that you capture all the way through the chain, um, it creates a, an amazing headache for the people producing it. Of course, there's a lot of money behind that industry, um, and there's a lot of value extracted from that. But actually having mechanisms to manage that data, to understand the data you have, to tie together different forms of data are of a huge interest there. And it's underlying that is basically about understanding the data you have in various different forms. Um, so that's what I'll talk some more about today. Um, so this is an example from a London-based comp company just down the road here, actually, double negative, um, inception. So you can see the one of the scenes where they fold over a, a three-dimensional model of Paris. It's all kind of photorealistic um, in the video. And to, for something like that, they use half a million digital stills images to create the final product on the screen. Um, on top of that, of course, they'll use a lot of other data as well. So typically, you'd have, uh, you'll have your principal camera or cameras. You'll have a set of witness cameras around that that are collecting information. You also have 3D scans of the scene using LiDAR information. You generally have high dynamic range imagery to capture the illumination of the scene. And all of those things are collected um, in a slightly structured fashion, but they're collected under the pressure of production. Um, and they essentially, they're different data sources, different essence data sources that don't have any explicit link between them when you, when you capture them, except for the fact that they're captured from the same scene. So in this case, you might have a very complex scene, but all the data has some link to that, and that's what we use to actually manage the data, the fact that in the end, they've all come from the same spatial location. So what we want to be able to do is man manage that kind of sea of unstructured data uh, from different sources. Um, and the first reason for doing that is 
that if you're sitting on set, um, it costs about upwards of $100,000 a day for your production with your actors, mainly going to the actors. Um, you have to make good use of that time. And if you don't capture the data that you want for your production in that space of time, it's probably impossible to come back afterwards and recapture it in any way. So the first thing that they'd like to be able to do is verify that you actually captured the data you want. And the process at the moment in the industry is actually they, don't, they can't do that. So what happens is then you have a hugely redundant data collection because you have to make sure that somewhere in there is the thing you want later on. Um, so they capture probably 50 to 100 times more data than they'll actually use in the final production. So having actually tool sets that can verify what you captured and check, for instance, that you've got scene coverage from your camera images um, are hugely useful things. Um, and also, alongside that is the ability to make decisions based on your data. So in the end, it's a creative process. You want to give the creative people, um, the director on set, the, the tools that allow them to make the right decisions to make the best production. Um, so this is a, a particular problem around the entertainment industry, but actually the data analysis techniques that are going in here are very slim, similar to data analysis techniques that have been talked about today. Um, we're building models of things. We're trying to understand things from the real world. You've generally got a set of actors. You've got some sort of scene space that you're trying to understand. Um, and you're trying to structure that in some way. So a lot of the underlying tools are, are relevant to the wider problems. Uh, this is just an image of the, the kind of data flow through for a particular scene. And the th I guess the thing to understand here is there's lots of arrows and links between that data flow and how it's going to be used. One thing that's worth saying, which was brought up in one of the discussions earlier, is so this is a creative process, so there's almost always a human in the loop. So in the end, what you're trying to do is free that creativity and allow a person to be able to interact with the data. And that comes back to the same thing of, you know, almost always here, you want to be able to have some level of interaction. You don't want it to be com completely automated. The tools should just sit there to assist in the background. But if you really need to go in there and intervene with something, you should be able to do that as well. Um, so these are some of the kind of data sets we get. And what we're doing in this case, these are all, um, well, they're image data and 3D data, and we're putting them into a unified 3D space in this case. Um, and this is just one example from film production. Um, so what we tend to do with the image data, with the video data, we'll turn that into a, a 3D asset, and then the problem becomes one of matching between different 3D assets, essentially. And we can do that because we know we've got a common space underlying this. This is the real world we're looking at. So it's either 3D or it has a temporal extension as well. And that's the thing we use to essentially structure the data um, and end up with everything within a, a single framework. So this is an example of kind of a typical, this isn't on a film production set, this is on a, a, a test production. A typical thing you might film with a, a multi-camera system, so the raw data, um, we're then extracting, separating out elements from that data. Um, in this case, we're interested in the actors. Um, we're reconstructing the scene from the data. Um, so you've got three big 3D scene models. This is a, a visual reconstruction. We'd also typically have a, a LiDAR scan for that. We can reconstruct the foreground from the video. Um, this would generally be a dynamic sequence like this. You can see it's quite noisy in terms of structure. Um, so the 3D here, that's very useful in production. It's used as a reference, essentially, for any CG effects you want to put into the film. Um, and then you've got, yeah, so that it's going through some texturing of that and then putting back in the, the 3D elements. So at this, at this stage, this is all kind of raw data processing, if you like, with a limited amount of understanding. We'd go on from that to put in scene structure, so building models and things like that. And I'll talk a little bit about understanding things about the people in the scene. So within the entertainment industry, what they're interested in is essentially tools to manipulate that data. And the way this is being done, and this is active research at the moment, is essentially to extract metadata from, from your raw data and use essentially a metadata filtering pipeline that allows you then to index the data in the right way. So if you imagine this in the context of Google and YouTube or something of that sort, 
Essentially, what you'd want to do is extract information about the image sequence and then use that information, maybe it's the, the people involved in the scene or the type of scene you have, use that information then to be able to filter that data and, and search it to find the relevant things. Um, so that's what the computer vision technology behind this is doing. Um, and as I said, we're dealing with very large data sets, so it's generally distributed. You want to do as much as possible online because you don't really want to, to store um, all the data uh, because of the volumes involved, and you need interfaces for people to be able to interact and manipulate the data. Um, okay, so you can do this also in a distributed way um, using things like WebGL for indexing over the web and interaction and progressive distribution of this kind of data set. So this is an example of progressive distribution across the web of, uh, of some large-scale 3D data sets that, again, in a production context. Um, okay, so that's the static elements of the scene. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, dealing with dynamic elements and specifically people, which make up a large part of video content. Um, so what we generally do is capture 2D video, and what we can fairly easily do is reconstruct 3D information from that. But what we're really interested in is actually going from that f few through to full kind of 4D models of the performance, the actor, which are spatiotemporally coherent. And this is relevant in the medical domain as well as in the um, entertainment domain, where actually you can tell where everything on that surface has moved over time. Um, so again, this is a, a process of data analysis, but what we're doing from that 4D data then is learning about the characteristics of how these surfaces deform over time. Uh, and that's exactly the information actually you need then to be able to interpret uh, dynamic information in real scenes. Um, so one of the things you can do is capture large data sets from this. Um, so you can capture kind of populations of different motions, different people. Um, there's a huge variability here if you put clothing and things like that into the mix. Um, and this is just dealing with the shape side of things. You've also got appearance on top of that. So very high dimensional data. Um, but from that, you can build models that characterize that data uh, using some of the techniques we heard about earlier. Um, in terms of learning statistical models effectively from data sets um, for highly nonlinear things. Um, so one, one thing that kind of struck, struck me as being related to some of the things we heard about earlier was, so what we, what we actually capture is 3D video data and what we want to go through is things that are temporally coherent that match over time in our case. Um, and one of the ways we do that is to look at similarity in the data. Um, so we've seen various examples of similarity earlier on. And there's an interesting thing here that you can, once you've got a similarity, you can then build relationships between the data. And that's, that's the way, essentially, in this context, we're doing alignment. It applies to lots of types of data. It applies to images. We saw an example earlier. It applies to video data. In this case, it happens to be shape. The only thing that really changes for those different forms of data is what the metric is you use in your similarity matrix. Yeah? So this is a very powerful mechanism for taking raw data and, and restructuring it, if you like, and extracting useful information. So in this case, we're, we're doing some matching between different frames to build up a similarity matrix, shown with the colors here. You can see you've got a, a diagonal stripe in dark blue, which is the self-similarity, so all those frames are the same. But you can also see structure in here. So this is just a comparison of kind of a walking and running motion here. Um, to see the structure you get out. Um, so what we do that is then use that to restructure our data, and that allows us to align things. And essentially from that, we're building a tree structure you're seeing here, and then using relatively simple alignment. And the, and the power of that is that what you're doing is you're taking a very large data set, you're working out similar parts in the data set, and then you're using very simple algorithms to actually do the alignment and come up with something that's... a a structured representation, and that takes us back to, to this example, where you can tell now where every point moves on the, on the body or on the face um, in this particular context of entertainment, but it has a much broader application behind it. Um, so that kind of 4D modeling is very relevant to understanding the kind of things that go on in the real world. So in the example on the left here, we're using that in an athletics context to understand performance. 
so human performance again, but in a much less controlled environment. Um, so that's really what we'd like to be able to do. Um, we'd like to be able to take that out and capture large volumes of data, very unstructured scenes, huge variability due to lighting, for instance. You know, the big challenge in face recognition is actually to do with illumination. Um, we'd like to be able to understand both people and animals. Um, and it, potentially these things provide a context for a measurement technology that doesn't require any contact with the subject. Um, so it gets us away from the kind of clinical measurement technologies you have at the moment where you have to place markers and things like that on, on the subject for, for motion analysis. Um, and we'd like to deal with general scenes within this. Um, so the context we're looking at the moment is being driven by the entertainment industry, but we're now looking at applications, for instance, in healthcare. Um, okay, so there's a, an application also in sports. You know, so this is large-scale scene coverage. And in this example, you can see it's a, a rugby match going through and actually reconstructing those scenes and understanding what's happening in that scene context, um, understanding what, what the motion is and things like that. Um, and I think at that point I'll, I'll move on to wrap up. So um, what I've talked about is a specific context of 4D measurement and some of the challenges there, and that's dr been driven for us by the entertainment industry. But underlying this is a, a much richer field of general scene understanding and a set of tools, essentially, that come from the computer vision and machine learning communities that are data analysis tools and data structuring tools. And they apply to many of the things, and we've seen examples elsewhere in the medical imaging, but I, they apply to, essentially, searching for patterns from large, unstructured data sets. And the challenge in the work I've talked about here is that, well, if you take a camera or and you take an image of a scene, it's hugely unstructured what you see in the scene. So the only way you can get a, a handle on analyzing that is to have very powerful models that tell you something about what the structure is you're likely to see. And that's the same, I think, in many of the problems we've seen today. And with that, I'll finish. <coughs>